We're back, Cosmic Queries. Of course, I got Chuck Nice on this. That's right. And I, and I have to call him a special guest, Brian Cox. You know, we don't get him often. A friend and colleague and uh, a physicist extraordinaire. And, and Brian, it's just been a delight to have you uh, on this side of the, the ocean. And so thanks for uh, gracing us with your expertise and your charm and, and everything else that gets people excited about the universe. Now, we just spent the whole first of three segments talking about destroying Earth with the Higgs boson. Yeah. Uh, so, Brian, my favorite an analog for the Higgs field, did I tell you this? It's, uh, when I, if, if I'm in L.A., I refer to a, the Higgs field is like a party field in Los Angeles. Okay? So, you, you go into a party and nobody knows who you are. And you have to get to the bar, which is at the other side of the huge room. And you could just walk there and get there pretty quickly. But Beyonce enters <laughs> and people crowd around her and she can mo only move much more slowly to the bar. So she has a much higher party mass than someone that nobody's ever heard of in Los Angeles. So yeah, th exactly. is, that, that, is that an exact mathematical analog? <laughs> to the it's a really good one. analogy. I mean, it's, 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 that, it's the interaction that, that, that causes the mass. Co correct. And it's different from your molasses because your molasses probably has sort of the same um, um, uh, uh, formula for the force on it. I mean, maybe that's also true for the Higgs boson. I don't know. But the, the uh, what is it, the V squared uh, resistance to motion you know, like air resistance, right? So, but here it's it's in the party field. You're right. It, they're they're one on one interactions that completely define everything about it and who gets to the bar faster. So Beyonce never gets to the bar. Right. That's how that works. And that is uh, that is why, based on my career, I am drunk. Because <laughs> you got to the bar like, real fast. I can't even get away from the bar. It's like I can't, couldn't get to the bar fast enough. <laughs> Who's that guy? Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. So give me, give me another one. What's, what's the next question you got for us? Elaine Bredeau says, hey, guys. Uh, Elaine here from Montreal, Canada. Uh, All right. Why do we say that nothing can travel faster than light when the universe is expanding? faster than light and entangled particles communicate with each other faster than light and also when we say that a black hole is so dense that even light can't escape it well it makes it sound as if there is actually light inside the black hole trying to get out but to me if a star gets spaghettified and reduced to a stream of atoms while entering the black hole there is no fire in that light going on <laughs> only <laughs> atoms am i right <laughs> So there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take the one which Neil can talk about as well. Let's take the, the, the easy bits first. So, so um, yes, um, in so, so often we describe space-time this as the fabric of the universe. The title of Brian Greene's great book, right? The Fabric of the Universe, uh, and, and indeed, light travels at the speed of light over that thing, that surface, that fabric, and nothing travel faster than it. And that's really built into the geometry itself, and it, and it allows the universe to respect cause and effect and all sorts of things, right? So it's, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, and actually, we should say, going back to the previous question, it's massless particles that travel at the speed of light. Uh, light happens to be massless because it doesn't interact with the Higgs field, going back to the previous thing. So, so light's not the special thing. It's actually things without mass, right? Um, but the expansion of the universe, you can picture, you really can picture it like a, a sheet. Like it's often described as a rubber sheet, just a stretchy kind of sheet. And, you, and it stretches. And so the distance between two points increases over time. If you just stretch any old thing at a constant rate, but it's very big, then if you have very distant points, then they recede from each other very quickly. And indeed, no matter what the expansion rate is, you, you can get so far apart that these things will be receding from each other faster than light. But it's not that they're moving, they're not moving through the universe faster than light. It's the universe is just stretching rather sedately. So if the universe is a medium, then they're not traveling through the medium. The medium itself is doing the moving and they're just kind of sitting there along for the ride. 
Yes, yes. Yeah, so they they li literally r ride along with the with the stretch of the universe. Okay. Called the co-moving volume. And all well, sorts just to be clear, stuff. astrophysically, they could be moving on their own. They could be orbiting other galaxies and uh -huh. things. They could have their own motion. So they're okay. But that motion itself is, is not is, <clears throat> is in the fabric is, of the universe. Oh my god. And the expansion of the universe is 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 a, is a level above that. Right. right. Oh. Okay. But when, when you get so so for example Andromeda. The galaxy is coming towards us, so not everything's moving away from everything else because it's close enough that the gravitational interaction between the Milky Way and Andromeda completely overwhelms the stretch. But if you go out to large enough distances, then the, the stretch wins and everything flies apart from everything else. But as Neil said, that they can be, they, as you said, they can be absolutely stationary in in the fabric of the universe. I mean, it's kind of you've got to be careful with the, these are these are models, right? And these are pictures. Um, if you so, if you look at what Einstein's um, sort of equations tell you, they don't. They just tell you you've got points, and you can define some distance between them, and you can see how that distance changes, and that's it, really. But yes, yeah, so that's the point. It, it's not. There's nothing strange about the fact that things can recede from each other faster than the speed of light. That just is a property of something that just stretches with things in it. Okay. Well, keep going. There are more things in this list because I think the I think the questioner has a point where here we are saying there's nothing. Speed of light is the limit, and now we're saying no. They can, space can stretch faster than the speed of light. We have quantum entanglement, which moves faster than light, and tunneling is faster than light. All of this. So yeah. maybe we should stop saying nothing moves faster than light. Well, so you you can certainly say that information doesn't travel faster than the speed of light between two places or two events, whatever you want to call them. Quantum entanglement is a great thing. It, it, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's... Yeah, give, um, us a, give us a minute on that. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, um, so you can imagine, I always describe it in terms of quantum coins, right? So you can have these, you have a quantum coin, which is uh, heads 50% of the time when you look at it and tails 50% of the time when you look at it. But the key weird thing about quantum mechanics is that... Uh, it will not be heads or tails until you look at it. And we can have a huge philosophical discussion about what that means. And there's a whole literature on it, but just that's the way that nature behaves, right? So the, the coin can be- oh, By the way, just, just to be clear, Brian, just because we don't want to like mislead people here. It has nothing to do with your eye brain connection. No. Right. <laughs> right. It's, not, it's not that you look at it, it's that if you make a measurement of it, no matter what's making the measurement. Right. Hundred percent correct. Okay. Like very, very important. It has because... nothing to do with your consciousness nothing. or anything else. Okay. Nothing. So, mm -hmm. but it's an entangled state of two quantum coins, and I do this in my live show. Actually, I write it down. You can have a pair of quantum coins, and they can be in the state heads, tails, plus tails, heads, heads, tails, plus tails, heads. So that's what they are. The, the, if, if you look at them, uh, right, with the caveat you said, if they're. <laughs> then there, there could be heads, tails, or tails, heads. Never heads, head, or tails, tails. They're always all, they're always all those things. They're always heads or tails. Yeah. Well, and then, but then in the so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, if you, if you look at them, then they, they will then become, if you look at them with the caveat Neil said, you've got to be careful with language, then they will be in one or other of those configurations. Wow. So the key thing about entanglement is, you can separate that those coins then, but they're still in that entangled state. You're very careful about it. And we've done this. Quantum computers work like this, right? So you separate them, they're still in that entangled state. And then as the question has said, it is true that if you then make an observation of one of them, then then you, you, then it, and, it, and it turns out it's heads. Even if it's a billion light years away, the other one's then tails because that was the state it was set up in. If that one's heads, that one's tails, and if that one's tails, that one heads. So that, that's quantum entanglement in, in a nutshell. And it is indeed, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. He didn't like it at all. So there is, however, however, the really important thing to say is you can't signal using that process. Even though you might intuitively think I could send Morse code or something, I could send dots and dashes, I could say yes or no. Immediately across the universe, I could answer a question, yes or no. You can't with that. It's really built into the structure of the theory. So even if, if you might think that the, the spirit 
of relativity is being broken. The letter of the law is not, because information doesn't travel faster than the speed of light in that sense. So what about all this talk about the future of entanglement possibly uh, being the foundation for, uh, for encryption? Oh, yeah. So the, the, this is it's often described. If you think about that entangled system, it's a very rich system. It's much richer than just two bits. They're called qubits, these things. You, you gave the simple you gave the simplest possible case. Yeah, yeah. And so it's uh, generally you can entangle things, photons, for example, or electrons, you can entangle them. Um, and and the, the point is that the, the structure, the information potential, if you like, is much richer. It's often entanglements often in quantum computing is called an information resource, right? So you're right. So you can do things with this. You can build very powerful computers. They're very good at certain things at the moment, one of which is breaking encryption, right? They're extremely good at factorizing large numbers, which is what our banking is built on. So yes, uh, so you, so that they, they are part of our technology now. This property of the universe is part of our technology. Oh, by the way, Chuck, do you know who has the world record for most distant entangled particles in the world? No. China. Someone asked me that the other day, and I couldn't. I didn't know how what the distance is. I know people have done it over the. Oh, so they they've done it from Earth to orbit. And China oh. did it, so it's the, it's Earth orbit distance, and they've also done it in fiber optics, which I think is harder, right? Because it's not just open air, so to speak, yeah. and there could be more ways to break the entanglement and preventing mm -hmm. the great distances. So unless I saw there's 50 kilometers entangled via fiber optics, which means this can work across a city uh, scale, for example. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll, but I'll tell you how, um, it's a very good question, because how, how difficult it is to understand really fundamentally. There's a Leonard Susskind is one of the great um, black hole theorists, a great theoretical physicist, who wrote, by the way, a brilliant book called The Theoretical Minimum. If you're really interested in quantum mechanics and you really want to get down into it, his book, The Theoretical Minimum on Quantum Mechanics is superb. And isn't he the guy who's like a, a big exponent of the holographic universe too? Yes, uh, he, he invented that really with Gerald, Gerald Tooth. But he um, has got, he came up with a theory which he works on called ER equals EPR. So EPR is really this entanglement. It's Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen. So they, in the, in the 30s, I think it was, Einstein with these two colleagues did a lot of work on entanglement, really trying to understand it and see what it meant for reality. And uh, ER is Einstein, Rosen, which is wormholes. So there is a picture of quantum entanglement which has come to the surface in trying to understand black holes that you can picture these things being separated by, as I said, light years, these quantum coins or whatever you want to call them, being linked with a wormhole, uh, which links them together. And, and so that's very a very kind of cutting edge, advanced way of looking at it, which is not altogether widely accepted, but a, a mainstream in the study of black holes and how information gets out of black holes. Well, but at least that feels better hmm. than this happening in the middle of empty space, right? I mean, if you connect him with a wormhole, however exotic that is, I can feel that, all right? I'm, I'm with you on that, all right? And then the, the structure of the universe is all uh, connected by wormholes pairing up entangled entities. Yeah. What we're looking at is something called emergent space-time, which is very cutting edge. Sean Carroll, actually, you will know, wrote a good book on this. I think it's called Something Deeply Hidden. Sean called a physicist at Caltech. I think he's uh, he, he's moved recently. Is that correct? Yeah, right? Sean Hopkins, I think. Yeah. But, uh -huh. but, um, but so this idea that is that space time emerges from quantum entanglement. So I think mm. it's true to say the general view now uh, in the, cut, uh, the cutting edge is that entanglement and space and time are intimately linked. And so you're losing me on. I know I don't. I don't want to take up the show because now I'm lost on the. <laughs> I am lost <laughs> on this right entanglement, it. entanglement, this is... and the black holes because you're talking about, you know, what she says in the question here is, you know, you're talking about spaghettification reduced to a stream of atoms, and then you were talking about the information coming out. So uh, 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 maybe I'm too sci-fi in this reconstruction of this information. How do you do that without losing all the information? If you come down to the atoms themselves get broken apart, I'm, I don't understand how that would actually that entanglement would then be anything 
um, on on the side of reconstitution? What would it be? It's it would just be a big mess. It's a brilliant question. And um, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, my uh, God, it is. <laughs> See, wait, wait, it, 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 the, Chuck is about to pop right there. Okay, Chuck, no, I'm just saying, like, don't be a, don't be afraid not to know what the <laughs> people are talking about because you might end up asking a brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, wait, we actually, Brian, we got to take.